The ocean is a magnificent and inhospitable place, cold, dark, and violent. It's an environment that humanity's been dealing with since the beginning of time. Many have traversed the ocean's surface, but only relatively recently have we started to tackle the final frontier of the sea, the abyssal depths. As you descend deeper and deeper into the ocean, the laws of physics act instantly and harshly against you. Most of the visible light spectrums absorbed within 10 meters of the water's surface, and almost none penetrates below 150 meters, even when the water is very clear. As you go deeper, the temperature drops and the pressure quickly becomes immense. Every 10 meters adds another atmosphere of pressure. Recreational divers can safely descend to 33 meters. During the descent, your ears must be equalized constantly. Slowly, everything becomes more and more blue. As other colors of visible light disappear, nitrogen narcosis may begin to set in. Even at this relatively shallow depth, the surface can feel distressingly far away. But deeper than this, much, much deeper, there is still work to be done. Precise, technical work that requires sharp concentration and hours of manpower. Working so far below the surface should be beyond human capability. Yet every day, the ocean floor is occupied by people in strange suits carrying out extremely difficult tasks. So, how is it that we can send people to these depths to complete complicated tasks, sometimes working underwater for hours at a time? What science is involved in this dangerous but essential job that enables these divers to stay alive? Commercial divers work to maintain offshore oil rigs and pipelines, performing tasks that require more precision and maneuverability than a remotely operated vehicle can handle. Divers are needed to operate flow valves, bolt pipes together, or clear debris. The work is essentially heavy-duty construction that happens to be underwater. It's an isolated and dangerous job, often involving work at depths of up to 500 meters. There's danger in being so far from the surface, relying on your hoses for air supply, heat and communication, and dealing with heavy construction materials. But much of the danger divers face doesn't come from the cold and darkness of the depths, but rather from returning to the surface. Decompression sickness, or the bends, is a debilitating disorder that occurs due to a rapid decrease in pressure on the body, causing gases dissolved in the tissues to form potentially life-threatening bubbles. Any divers must be very cautious to avoid this dangerous phenomenon. For divers working at extremely great depths and for long periods, if not managed carefully, decompression sickness would definitely be fatal. Air is composed of approximately 78% nitrogen and 22% oxygen. Normally, at the surface, we simply exhale the nitrogen we inhale, as our bodies don't use it. But when diving at depth, each breath contains many more molecules of oxygen and nitrogen than a breath taken at the surface due to the increased pressure. And with all these additional molecules entering the lungs, they start to accumulate in the body. As the pressure increases, nitrogen gas dissolves. More and more nitrogen dissolves into the body's tissues. This dissolved nitrogen is fortunately harmless in our bodies as long as we remain under pressure. But when it's time to return to the surface, the problem begins. As external pressure decreases during ascent from a dive, the accumulated nitrogen forms bubbles in the blood and tissues. Gas comes out of solution when pressure decreases, just like when you open a soda bottle. If these bubbles are too large or form too quickly, they can damage tissues or even block blood vessels. The blockage of blood vessels causes pain and, in the worst cases, death. In regular diving, this risk is mitigated by ascending to the surface gradually, allowing nitrogen to diffuse slowly out of the tissues and be exhaled through the lungs, thus avoiding the buildup of large nitrogen bubbles. For example, a dive to 75 meters for an hour would require a 5-hour ascent to avoid decompression sickness. The longer the dive, the more dissolved nitrogen accumulates in the tissues, and thus the longer the necessary decompression time. For deep-sea divers working at much greater depths and for many more hours, the time required for a safe ascent would be far too long to be feasible. In addition to the deadly effects of decompression sickness, nitrogen plays other tricks on the body. Nitrogen narcosis is a condition that affects many divers during deeper dives. Typically, nitrogen narcosis sets in around 30 meters. At this depth, it can cause an alteration in consciousness, essentially giving the feeling of being drunk. 
While not harmful in itself, slowed mental activity, euphoria, and overconfidence can lead divers to disregard safety practices at 30 meters. In a recreational dive, the effects can be somewhat amusing and are simply reversed by ascending a few meters. However, as you go deeper, the effect can become debilitating, and mental impairment may become extremely hazardous. Below 90 meters, it can lead to hallucinations, memory loss, or unconsciousness, which for deep-sea divers performing complex and dangerous tasks could quickly become fatal. Scientists don't fully understand what causes it, but they believe that nitrogen gas, or any inert gas except helium and probably neon, reacts with lipids or fatty tissues, most of which make up the brain, causing an anesthetic effect. Thus, due to the complex interaction between the physics of gases and body physiology, deep-sea diving remained out of reach for a long time. However, this changed in the 1960s, when NASA was working on its mission to land men on the moon. The Office of Naval Research was working on its own extraordinary mission, sending men to the bottom of the ocean. In July 1964, an odd-looking vessel was launched from the Navy's Oceanographic Research Tower off the island of Bermuda where it sank to a depth of 60 meters. Twelve hours later, four Navy divers entered the underwater laboratory, ready to begin a unique 21-day experiment. Their mission was to participate in the Navy's first extended physiological test to determine how men could work freely and for long periods beneath the surface. The primary goal of the Sea Lab project was to see if dangerous and time-consuming daily decompressions could be eliminated by providing a shelter near the dive site kept at a pressure equal to the diving pressure. This would, in theory, allow the men to work longer and at greater depths. As mentioned earlier, when under pressure, each breath contains more molecules of nitrogen and oxygen than at the surface, and the additional nitrogen dissolves into the tissues. But after enough time at a certain pressure, the body becomes fully saturated with nitrogen. More time at that depth will not add more nitrogen to the tissues and therefore, additional bottom time will not increase the decompression time. Because of this, divers can stay pressurized indefinitely, performing multiple long dives while only needing one long decompression after days, weeks, or even months under the surface. This type of diving was coined saturation diving, and is much safer than making multiple short dives, each requiring its own extensive decompression. The dives can also be deeper and longer, since decompression can occur in a controlled habitat. However, while decompression sickness is managed with this method, it does not solve the problem of nitrogen narcosis. Nitrogen breathed at a depth would still be incapacitating underwater or in the living quarters. To avoid this issue, saturation divers don't breathe normal air. Instead, they breathe a gas cocktail called heliox, which replaces most of the nitrogen in normal air with helium. Helium doesn't cause the narcotic effect that nitrogen does and is harmless to the human body. Decompression from a heliox dive also requires less time than with an air mixture that contains more nitrogen. However, breathing helium comes with its own consequences and sounds exactly as strange as you'd expect. I came out of the decompression chamber about four hours ago and everyone's healthy. While assuming for those of us who don't have to deal with it for weeks, it could become annoying and really problematic. It's hard to understand people through the communication systems with these voices. Therefore, surface personnel often have to use a piece of equipment called a helium descrambler, which electronically lowers the pitch of the diver's voice. After a series of sea lab experiments, it soon became clear that it would be easier and cheaper to monitor and support divers if the pressurized living quarters weren't actually at the bottom of the sea, but instead on dive support vessels and kept under pressure. Mechanically, divers enter the chambers and the decompression process begins. Slowly and carefully, the pressure increases to match the pressure they'll experience at the working depth. After about 72 hours, the divers' bodies become saturated with the inert gas. To reach the seabed, divers exit their pressurized habitat through an airlock and enter a diving bell, which is also pressurized. The diving bell is then lowered to the required working depth, and the divers exit the bell into the cold, dark water to work. Once the divers have finished their shift, they re-enter the bell which is hoisted back to the surface, and the next shift can begin. Even though they're physically close to others aboard the dive support vessel, they might as well be in space. The general rule for decompression is 24 hours for every 33 meters of pressure, so it could take days to decompress from a deep dive and rejoin. If done carefully, and if there are no catastrophic equipment failures, saturation diving can be performed safely. 
However, divers must remain in a pressurized environment for the duration of their work time, which can be up to three weeks or more. This means living in very cramped quarters with other divers, with no privacy whatsoever. Mentally and physically, it's extremely taxing. Although mostly safe due to advancements in protocols and technology, it's not without its dangers. If an airlock fails, the pressure would explosively decrease and bubbles would rapidly form in the blood, effectively boiling it. Bodies can be, and have been, shot out through any opening, no matter how small. This is immediately and horrifically fatal, and even with rigorous safety protocols in place, decompression is still hard on the body and comes with many risks. During decompression, divers report joint pain, headaches, and difficulty breathing. Unfortunately, these symptoms are similar to the early signs of decompression sickness. Experienced divers know how to distinguish between them, but if any diver suspects they might be suffering from the bends, the entire team will have to restart the decompression process. The only cure for early signs of decompression sickness is to return to a higher pressure saturation. Diving's not for the faint of heart. There's a constant sense of danger. Exiting the diving bell and entering a pitch black underwater world is enough to make anyone nervous, and spending days and weeks in confined spaces would be enough to drive most people mad. But what if there was a way to eliminate the need for these claustrophobic pressure chambers? What if there was a way to completely remove the risk of decompression sickness and the lengthy decompression times? In part two of this video, I'll explore one of the most astonishing concepts in modern science. So strange that it sounds like science fiction, liquid breathing. This concept turns everything we've just discussed about the human body in a deep water environment on its head and could revolutionize diving, medicine, and space travel as we know it. Pushing the limits of the human body is something humanity's been doing since the dawn of time. Whether flying, climbing, or diving, we can't resist the pull of extreme environments. Deep sea divers certainly push these boundaries, and liquid breathing could allow these intrepid individuals to go even deeper.